standing on business for God. So uh, many of you may be wondering what is standing on business, um, but we're going to find that out tonight. So let us just pray. Father God, we thank you for another night where we can come together for our Wednesday night meeting. Lord, I pray that as we go through this topic that we will learn something from your word tonight, oh God, in your name I pray. Amen. All right, so standing on business. So as I said, many of you may be wondering what does standing on business mean? Now, I'm going to ask you guys to have a guess. What, what does standing on business mean? Let me hear from at least two to three persons. What do you think standing on business means? Anyone? There are not many young persons here. It's actually... a modern slang that has been used in the past few years amongst the younger generation. But I want to hear from our audience here tonight. What does standing on business mean? Or what do you think it means? I think from a Christian point of view, uh, we can easily say we are about the master's business. Oh, that's Okay. my All little right. input. Thank you, Sister Melrose. Anyone else? What does standing on business mean? It doesn't have to be from a Christian point of view. Just in general, what do you think it means? At first, I'm hearing it, but it sounds like it means um, uh, committing to what you agree or doing what you agree. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sandra. One more. Be being business like and really, really and stand up for for business. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brother Dale, and thank you for those who participated. So, got three guesses. Not quite the meaning that it uh that it suggests in the modern world today. So I'm gonna give you the multitude of meanings for standing on business. And this is according to the Urban Dictionary and US, USA Today. So standing on business means to take care of your business or obligations or to stand by the values and boundaries you set for yourself. Three, to handle your own affairs when faced with a situation. Four, to put your money where your mouth is. All right, so you have those confident persons. I, I know we have that American sprinter that always loves to talk. And before she won that um, world championship medal, um, she wasn't putting her money where her mouth was, right? And she wasn't walking the walk. Uh, uh, she wasn't walking the walk. She was just talking the talk as the last Um, definition says and it also means to mind your business so that's the essence of standing on business take care of your business obligations to put your money where your mouth is to stand by the values and boundaries you set for yourself so now that we know these definitions what does it mean to stand on business for god And here's what I've come up with. Standing on business for God means abiding by God's principles no matter what. Standing on business for God means abiding by God's principles no matter what. So throughout this message, we're going to be focusing on that. And wh why do we have to stand on business for God? And to do that, we'll be focusing on a few stories in the book of Daniel, And these stories will show us, show us three things. How to stand on business for God, the challenges to us standing on business for God, and the benefits on standing, the benefits of standing on business for God. So let's turn our Bibles firstly to Daniel 1. And we're going, we know this uh, popular story where it focuses on the training in Babylon. And this passage of scripture, in this passage of scripture, is where King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon has captured Judah. He takes back to Babylon the articles from the temple of God from Judah and young noble Israelite men who were of the royal family. And among these men, of course, were Daniel, Hananiah, also known as Shadrach, Mishael, also known as Meshach, and Azariah, also known as Abednego. Right. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar orders the chief of his court officials to take the young men into his service and to teach and train them the ways of Babylon for three years. 
He also assigns them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. So we know this story. It's a very popular story. We all should know it. And we're going to go through this for our first few points. So let's talk about the challenge faced here in Daniel 1. And the challenge, I will term it as the conventions. And why do I say the conventions? If we look at Daniel 1 verse 3 to 7, it says, Then the king ordered As Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, of course, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they were given new names. So from the moment Judah was captured, the Babylonians wanted these men to forget about their homeland and their old lives. To do this, they gave them new names and identities. So, of course, Daniel was given the name Belshazzar and Hananiah Shadrach and Mishael Meshach and Azariah Abednego. They were also given new customs and languages to learn. So the Babylonians didn't want them to keep the customs and the ways of God and, and what they did in the Jewish circle. They wanted them to take on what was Babylonian and what it meant to be Babylonians. And thirdly, they wanted them to have a new lifestyle. And that's how it came where that came when the king said that they, he wanted to give them the food and the wine of Babylon. Now, applying this to our lives, this to me reflects the conventions of our world and what is out there in the world, what people want us to do that will take us away from God. There are so many ideologies and beliefs in our world today and so many of the ways things are being done go against the world of God. And there is a lot of pressure to follow the crowd and not to follow God. And that is one of the challenges that we have to face when standing on business for God. But how to stand on business for God? We have to conform to God's laws. We look at Daniel 1 verse 8 where Daniel is not is resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and the wine. And why did Daniel not want to defile himself? He was following Jewish law as God told the Jews that they were not allowed to eat certain food that would cause them to become ceremonially unclean. It was against the laws of God for them to eat food that was unclean and, and, and was not for him and for him alone. Now, Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah were not the only Israelites to be taken in and trained by the Babylonians. And they had a choice. All of them had a choice, either to follow God or to go along with what the Babylonians were saying. However, these four young men were the only Jews that did not eat the food of the king's table. And if we look at uh, Daniel 1, verse 12 to 14, it says, Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So Daniel already said, I'm not going to eat what you are giving me. Just give me some vegetables and water and let's see who, who, who will be the strongest and who will, who will be the smartest by the end of the 10 days. What is this teaching us? The main idea is that if we are going to stand on business for God, if we're going to be Christians standing on business for God, we must obey God's laws and conform to God's laws above all. Walking in obedience with him is more important than anything else in our lives. So we're not supposed to conform 
to what the world is telling us. We're not supposed to follow the conventions of our world, but we need to conform to God's laws. And that's the way or one of the ways to stand on business for God. But what is the benefit of this? How, how do we benefit from, from conforming to God's laws? He will bless you. God will bless you if we conform to God's laws, if we stand on business for God. And he did this in several ways in Daniel 1. If we look at verse 9, it tells us, Now God has caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. So one of the officials that were over, overseeing the, the procedure or the, or the process of training these Israelite young men uh, was talking to Daniel and Daniel was telling telling him that, no, we're not going to eat the meat and, and the food and the wine that you're giving us. And if I was that official, would, would I be looking to Daniel and saying, I would be looking to Daniel and saying, what are you talking about? We are in charge here. You tell us, we tell you what to do. You, you don't tell us what to do. But God, in that instance, he was able to put in that official's mind, some compassion and favor for Daniel. Then in verse 15, we look at how after the test, after the 10 days, Daniel and his friends were healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men who were eating the food and the wine given to them by the Babylonians. And then in verse 12, 17 to 21, it says, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So God blessed them. God blessed them because they, they were the ones who continued to conform to God's laws, to conform to his laws, despite the conventions that were being put on them by the Babylonians. So how can we apply this? If we conform to God's laws, instructions, or words, he will certainly bless us. Because in James 1 verse 22 to 25, it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who is like who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intensely into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So anyone who follows God's instructions conforms to his laws, conforms to his words, will be blessed. So those are the three points from Daniel 1. The challenge, the conventions, the how to stand on business for God, conform to his laws, and the benefit, he will bless you. Now let's look at our second story, which will give us our second points for this evening. And we're going to go to Daniel 3. Daniel 3. And in Daniel 3, we all know this one as well, the story of the image of gold and the fiery furnace. So in this chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar is now constructing an image of gold dedicated to himself and commands that the people of Babylon bow down before the image and worship it when the sounds of the instruments are heard. Whoever did not worship the image would be thrown into the blazing furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down before the image, which made King Nebuchadnezzar furious. Now I'm going to ask someone to please read for me Daniel 3, verse 16 to 26. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, <clears throat> Your Majesty, we will not try to defend ourselves. If the God whom we serve is able to save us from the blazing furnace, 
and from your power then he will. But even if he doesn't, your majesty may be sure that we will not worship your God and we will not bow down to the gold statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar lost his temper and his face turned red with anger at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual. And he commanded the strongest men in his army to tie the three men up and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up, fully dressed, shirts, robes, caps, and all, and threw them into the blazing furnace. Now, because the king had given strict orders for the furnace to be made extremely hot, the flames burnt up the guards who took the men to the furnace. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, still tied up, fell into the heart of the blazing fire. Suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. He asked his officials, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the blazing furnace? They answered, yes, we did, your majesty. Then why do I see four men walking about in the fire? He asked. They are not tied up and they show no sign of being hurt. And the fourth one looks like an angel. So Nebuchadnezzar went up to the door of the blazing furnace and called out, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Supreme God, come out. And they came out at once. Thank you, Sister Angie. So we see there that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down before the image. And, and Nebuchadnezzar was furious and sent them into the fire. What was the challenge here? The challenge to standing on business for God in this passage of scripture was the consequence. And when, when we're trying to stand on business for God, there will always be the consequences of our world or the consequences that society will put on us. So in Daniel 3 verse 10 to 11, the consequence here was that those who did not bow down before and worship the image constructed by the king would face the consequence of dying in the blazing furnace. As Christians, our faith can be tested by our fear of the consequences um, in our societies. What what can someone give me some of the consequences that we may face in so society or society may put on us for, for showing our faith or for standing on business for God? What what do you think are some of those consequences? Or how, how will people react? What are some of the negative reactions that we may face if we're persons who are Christians and are, are showing our faith in public and are standing on business for God? Yeah, uh, you're on. They can cancel you. They can cancel you. Excellent. So the, that's that's a that's a young people term, brother Wayne. They'll they'll cancel you. <laughs> so they'll they'll cancel you. Anyone else? They can take advantage of you. Um, stay soft. All right, so some of the examples I came up with are persecution. People will persecute us because we're Christians, and we see that a lot in some other countries where it's more serious, where they can be put to death for being Christians. There's also rejection. People might reject you. There's a fear of rejection. Um, because you're a Christian, they don't want to talk to you. Um, there might be abuse, abuse in the form of ver verbal abuse. They might say, oh, you're a Christian, wait, wait. You know, have no sense or Christianity no, no, no make sense. Those type of things and avoidance, people will avoid it. Wow. So these are some of the consequences that we can face in society. And, and there is sometimes in us Christians, there's a fear to stand out and stand on business for God because of these consequences. We don't want to face these consequences. However, the how to stand on business and what these three young men did was to choose faith over fear. So that's our second way of how 
to stand on business for God, to choose faith over fear. So as Auntie Angie read in Daniel 3, verse 16 to 18, the three young men were never going to go against their faith and bow down before an idol. As a matter of fact, they said that even if the Lord wouldn't deliver them from the fiery furnace, they will never serve the gods or worship the image of gold. They were so strong in their faith that they were sure that God will deliver them from the blazing furnace. And they were not afraid of the consequence of being burned to, to death. So what is this teaching us? As Christians looking to stand on business for God, we cannot be fearful of what other people may say or think about our faith and how they will react to our faith. So even if they will persecute us, even if there's there's the there's a possibility of rejection or the possibility of abuse for being a Christian or the possibility of being avoided by others because you're a Christian. We have to stand on business for God and choose faith over fear like three, these three young men did. And what is the benefit? He will be with you throughout. In Daniel 3 verse 24 to 27, we see that the young men are in the fire. But Nebuchadnezzar realizes that there's a fourth man in the fire. Who, who was this man in the fire? They, they only put three men in the fire. But who was that fourth man? God was oh with God. them throughout them being in the fire. Despite the fear of death, God was with them. And if you look in verse 27, uh, is when they come out of the fire and, and they're, they're, they're spotless. They're, there's no burns on them. They're not harmed because God was with them throughout. So God has pr promised us so many times in his word that he will protect us. He will be there with us throughout. For example, in Isaiah 43, verse 1 to 2, it says, But no, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. He says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. The Lord did not allow the three young Israelite men to be set ablaze in the fire because he was with them and they chose faith over fear. So I've done two points, two stories, two points. The challenges, the conventions, the consequences, how to stand on business, conform to God's law, and to choose faith over fear, and the benefits, he will bless you and he will be with you. For our final points, we'll turn to Daniel 6 and another popular story, Daniel in the lion's den. Now in Daniel 6, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is no longer there. In Daniel 5, it was his son who was king of Babylon, but he was ousted. And now we have Darius the Mede, who is now the ruler of the kingdom of Babylon. And in this chapter, he appoints 120 satraps to rule over the kingdom with three administrators over them. And one of those administrators is Daniel. Daniel, who has been serving from King Nebuchadnezzar through his son and now to King Darius. Now, the other administrators and satraps were not fond of Daniel. Why? Because he was just doing everything right. He, he would read the dreams right. He would always have favor with the king. And, and the others were jealous of him. And they wanted to find grounds for charges against him. So this was their plan. Can someone read Daniel 6, verse 6 to 9? All right, Daniel chapter 6, uh, reading at verse 6 to 9. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, making Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law 
of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. What a evil set of people. I try to put Daniel in a trouble um, and find a way for getting me in trouble. And uh, this is how the challenge comes about um, in standing on business for God. We're always going to face our critics, the critics who will come against us. So the, the satraps and the other administrators had to find something related to Daniel's faith in God to get him in trouble. And they were against his faith from the very beginning. From the beginning where them get jealous of him and how good he is doing. They were against his faith in God. And, and for them to find a way um, to get him in trouble by um, getting a decree against his faith was just wrong. They, they, were, they, were, they were looking to be a detester of his faith. They were critics of his faith. And I want to say to us tonight that there are always going to be those against our faith and criticizing our beliefs. But what should our response be? Are we going to stop standing on business for God? And this is where or how to stand on business for God comes in. We have to consistently stand for him. From Daniel 1 through to Daniel 6, where we are now, Daniel was standing on business for God. He never stopped, despite the challenges he faced and despite the persons and critics that were against him. Because if we look in verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room, where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three days, three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Just as he had done before. So he never stopped despite the decree that was put in place. Daniel continued to pray three times a day and he continued to stand on business for God. And this should be our response to the critics in our life, the critics around us and the detesters of our faith. It should be to consistently stand up for him, to continue standing on business for him. And what is the benefit of this? Before we go to the benefit, we know the rest of the story. Uh, Daniel, Daniel gets caught by these men and, and then the, the king is forced to put him in the lion's den. But what does Daniel do in the lion's den? He continues to pray. He continues to stand for him, even though he's in a moment where, where there seems to be no hope. He is with lions, lions who may kill him during the night. However, he continues to, to pray to God. And in Daniel 6, verse 17 to 23, we see the result of this. We see what happens after uh after, after Daniel is put in the lion's den. So a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring. But at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was saved. And this is where the benefit comes in. Comes in. God will reward you when you stand on business for him. If we look at verse 25, it says, Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is a living God and he endures forever. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. So Daniel prospered during the reigns of Darius and the reign of Sirius, of Cyrus the Persian. So we see here that after Daniel was saved from the lion's den, after the king saw 
how great Daniel's God is to save him from these lions. God rewarded Daniel. And he rewarded Daniel and the three others throughout Daniel, the, the, the book of Daniel. So God will reward those who stand on business for God. And there's also the ultimate reward for those of us in this life right now. What is the ultimate reward uh, for us if we stand on business for God? The reward is eternal life with God in heaven. So, our three points. The challenge is how to stand on business for God and the benefits of standing on business for God. The challenge is there will be the conventions of our world. There will be the consequences that our society puts on us. And there will be the critics who will go against our beliefs, who will go against our faith. But how can we stand on business for God? We need to conform to God's laws. We need to choose faith over fear. And we need to consistently stand for him. And the benefits, if we do stand on business for God, he will bless us. He will be with you and he will reward you. Thank you for listening. And I encourage us today to continue to stand on business for God in our daily lives as we continue to be Christians and as, as we continue to walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.